Um, let's bring out Dave Filoni and Simon Kinberg. <laughs> yeah, put him in the hot seat. That's good. We have some really fun episodes, which have a lot of comedy as well. <laughs> there are some episodes with only droids in them. Uh, so, so about Chopper, um, you know, let's just, let's not even look at these. Let's just jump right to You've it. You've changed your mind. Right, about whatever you planned on nope, saying is no. now moot. OK, let's, let's fair talk, enough. Start with the ending. That's a good place to start. Start right? with the ending. That's what terrible. was that about? What was that about, guys? Uh, I wouldn't tell you what it was about, but on Blu-ray and DVD, you'll be able to buy this. <laughs> and you'll be able to download it. I, first, before we start, I do want to say one thing. Um, I want to thank Troy Underwood, who's been with us uh, through the whole thing. You can imagine Troy having to deal with our dark side here, and, and it, you know, he's with us all the way, and Eric Coleman as well, who's with me on uh, Avatar the Airbender as well, all the way back to my Nickelodeon days, and Eric has been a big supporter of, of everything we're doing. And I want to thank all uh, my Lucasfilm compatriots. I'm not the only one to blame for what you saw. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, call out the, the story group led by Kerry Hart, who is a, a, a huge inspiration uh, to all of us. Uh, Henry Joroy, Steve Melching, the whole uh, writing group who uh, does a tremendous job as well for us. And Carrie Beck, uh, you know, one of our favorite Simon and I, for this whole mess that you've witnessed. Uh, we all went in knowing that it was going to be dark. And just so you know, this is fair for me to say before we get going here, that when this story got pitched out in the writer's room, we were all excited. And you can vouch for this. I was sitting there and I said, look, I have to say this. I know it's really exciting to pitch this really dark stuff. And it sounds great here in the writer's room, and it's awesome, and it's, it's powerful. And yet, a year from now, you're going to be in theater with a bunch of kids and family and a good Star Wars feeling, and it's a totally different thing because the dark side is intense, is the cautionary tale here. And I, you know, got vetoed, so I've made it dark and, and scary for you. So, But it's Darth Vader. You're not going to get, like, sunflowers and Jawas when... <laughs> Darth Vader shows up, so be careful what you wish for. Now you may proceed with your Inquisition, but I had to get all that out of the way. Kevin Kiner, my, my composer, did a wonderful job as well, I think. Kevin Kiner is fantastic. There's so many people, but anyway. Okay, I want to know first who was cheering Darth Vader when he came on the screen, because we got to look out for you guys later. Just... Dangerous people. Um, so let's talk. I know, you know some of the best things in Star Wars are mysteries left for fans to interpret. But answers are kind of nice, too. So without, you can, you can choose your own adventure here, but talk a little about the ending and Ahsoka's fate. Gosh, I'm, Dave, you should answer all the questions. <laughs> I have roped you in. There's no going back for you now. We talked about this quite a bit, though. We talked about it. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll rewind all the way, and maybe this will be a way to avoid the answer. Um, uh, I'll rewind you just all gave the way, it away. To when we when we when we talked about actually whether or not to bring in Clone Wars characters to season two, um, and what that would mean to the show, and one of the sort of responsibilities we felt was if we were bringing in these huge characters, we'd have to give them really dramatic arcs. They would have to have as dramatic um, uh, stories as our main characters, and uh, certainly. This, um, uh, at least ending for now, was something that we talked about um, throughout the process of working on the season and, uh, and knew we were going to end this way, this season. Yeah, with Vader, again, you can't bring Vader in to challenge Ezra and Kanan. He's just not going to be that interested in them. You had to have a character that he was personally invested in. And once we had a personal story uh, that, that would be the foundation of it, it made a lot more sense to tell the story. Plus, Ahsoka could interact with Ezra and Kanan, and you kind of get a, a more complete tale. Because this season, we wanted to challenge Ezra with the dark side and what, what that window is now that he's accessed some sort of power. Danger comes with that. He has to be responsible with that power. Will you use it for yourself, or will you use it selflessly? That's, that's always the big question. So along the way, we get to kind of deal with some old characters and, and see how they are dealing with these same issues along the way. And, and I told Simon early on, I said, I don't think for the last like two minutes or so of this 
yeah, so there's any dialogue. Well, that's actually, I mean, I think when I wrote the original draft of this, um, I wrote it with scenes, with dialogue. Uh, and, and then you took it and you sent us, all the people in the group, um, uh, a piece of music that isn't a piece of music, obviously, but it was a, a classical piece of music. It was. Right? It's more like Coral. depressing. Coral. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was your idea to, to, to make it all um, nonverbal and musical, which was 100% the right way to go. I also remember, and I don't know exactly if this was the moment of, of inspiration for this or it was just the first time I saw an image of it, we were all sitting around a table and you drew as you, you, Dave will draw images as we're working on story. Um, and it's not that he's not paying attention, it's just that he, he likes to draw. And, and uh, you drew an image of um, Vader's split mask or helmet, which was, I thought, like the most com one of the most compelling images I've ever seen in, in, in all of Star Wars. Uh, and it ended up in the show. But I, I do remember when you were actually just doodled it uh, um, during a meeting. No, that was, well, because if one of the images paramount to this story and all the versions of Ahsoka fighting Darth Vader that I've had over the years, and I've thought about it for a long time, is the image of her literally leaping up onto his, you know, chest there, because the scale always intrigued me that she's small and he's this, you know, monolith, and that she could just be poised up there and with her two sabers knock one away and then strike at the helmet. That was always something that lasted year after year after year. Uh, and sometimes she died and sometimes she didn't die after that course of events. So, but that, and I was telling Kiri and Simon about it and I said, oh, I said this image and Kiri's like, well, let's do it. And I was like, oh, just, wow, just that easily, let's just do it. So, and then we, there it was, and I thought it turned out pretty good, well, like that moment. And speaking of the, the dead or alive, is if she were to check a box. <laughs> I, don't, I think that, I think what, I think that right now what's important is it's really, it's really an, a, a moment for you as a fan and for me to see more of what you're made of, like how strong is your faith? Your, what do you believe? What, what did you see there in the final moments? Because I know what happened for sure. And I think that it would be just cruel and rob you of your own independence if I said blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like I didn't put an image of Vader like dragging your head along at the end. That'd be horrible. That would be like, I couldn't even get off this lot if that happened. And, and yet I didn't have a loth cat come up and purr at her ankle as she picked it up and said, <laughs> close one. So I don't, yeah, neither of those is an acceptable outcome. So I just kind of pick some really, for once, you'll say for once because I never answer your questions, but nebulous, nebulous with complete certainty as to what happened in my own mind, and now at conventions I'll be plagued uh, with what people Until the think, end of time. Which is fine, I can deal with that, because interest is good, because it means we keep making show. So that's fine. That's positive, okay. Fair enough. I want to come back to Ahsoka and Ezra, but I want to ask you guys about Darth Maul. He had such an interesting, almost Yoda-like approach to how he lured everybody in. Can you talk about developing his, his role in this episode? Uh, it was, again, something that we talked about pretty early on, how we, we all wanted to bring him um, in, 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 a, in a real way, uh, and in this sort of finale arc. Uh, and, and one of the debates was when we revealed his face. I remember also initially when we first started talking about it, it was immediate that you, that you saw it was him. And I don't remember if it was your idea or Kiri's idea or Henry's idea, do you remember who's idea? Somebody's idea, it wasn't mine, um, that you actually keep him cloaked and that Ezra and the audience come to actually trust him um, so that when you reveal him it's actually a surprise and, um, to the audience and that, and that Ezra and Kanan can have this debate about this guy because you've come to accept that he's an ally. Um, and in many ways he is an ally, right? Like there are certain things that he, they're, they're um, opposed to the same enemy. Uh, uh, but at any rate, yeah, we, we wanted to make him feel like he could potentially be a master um, in, in, in the episode. Well, it's, cloth is a pain in the butt for us, technically. It's, we have a very limited amount of cloth sim that we can do when you have Vader Cloth is an absolute. He has a lot so of cape, sure. He, his cape is simmed, and his, uh, Maul's hood is kind of pinned more on a rig. So 
that defines a lot. Like I would love to do a lot of flowing clothes and arcing cloth, but we just can't do it. So we have to design the characters design team to kind of fit the story we're telling and still be believable. But if you remember, there was a really, really ultra fan, uber nerdy beginning to this story arc, which was Ahsoka wasn't even in it. And we were trying to devise, you and I were very hot on this idea that we were gonna do an episode from Vader's point of view and he was hunting people. And you would think it was a crew of the ghost and only at the last moment would it be revealed that he was actually hunting Darth Maul. And then you and I were like, ah, it'd be Vader versus Maul. And it was like, yeah, that would be great. And then, but then it was, it was so just like self-serving, like roll of 20 stuff that we just couldn't. And the Ahsoka like, unless you story. Just made that so much nerdy, right? Yeah, it just became so much more compelling to say, but if it's Ahsoka and then slowly but surely it dwindled away. And then I had a follow-up meeting with you after the first version of the script, and I read it. And remember, I was telling you, "Gosh, we have to do, we have to, you know, eliminate this person, eliminate this person, eliminate this person, blind Kanan, like all this stuff." And I'm like, "Each one of these things is going to take so much time." And I was like, "I need everybody out by Act Three. Everybody out of the pool. Oh, I can only have Vader and Ahsoka to deal with to even resolve that because that was it's only like a seven-minute act." So any prolonged lightsaber fight, all that gets apportioned, like how much time I have to tell the story in 42 minutes. You know, in a longer format, all those beats would be stretched out longer, you can imagine. But yeah, it was one of the interesting panic moments of there's too much story in this short little time. Yeah, that could have been a two hour finale. Yeah, easily. So let's bring out a couple more faces. Come on out, Ashley Eckstein and Taylor Gray. <laughs> So that was the, the first time you both saw the episode, right? Yep. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How amazing was that? What happened? <laughs> yes, what? You got him right here, so, you know. I'll tell him next session. Well, I'll explain it in detail to Taylor, but that is not true. <laughs> not true. I won't do it. No, actually, I want to... It's kind of a big episode, kind of a big episode for Ahsoka. Kind of big. Talk about yeah. what, what did you know going in and, and what surprised you about that episode? Well, obviously I knew the lines I recorded. Um, and that was pretty much it. Uh, I've been giving Dave an incredibly hard time um, because we've known each other for 10 years now. And why do you say, ugh? That's a long time. <laughs> He's always told me everything, always the storylines ahead of time, and nobody believed me out there, but I didn't know. Um, and, wow, <laughs> I don't even have much to say. I'm still processing it. It was so beautiful and so amazing, and I do have a million questions, which now that I've seen it, you have to be forced to answer. Kind of, but see, you couldn't know what happened because Ahsoka didn't know what was going to happen to her. So if you knew it was going to happen, it would make your performance false. So I couldn't tell you ahead of time that which would happen to you. It doesn't make any sense. But now we can all know. I could tell her, but we won't tell you. <laughs> Unless, of course, she is truly dead, which is there's nothing more to tell. Because she wouldn't know that she's dead, so she'd just be dead. I, I don't even know what to do with you right now, Dave Filoni. I've been up since four. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, switch it down to Taylor. Ezra has had quite the arc this season, becoming more and more powerful, <coughs> getting tempted by the dark side. Talk about him partnering up with Maul and what, what do you think his future holds? Um, well, I just asked Dave a question when we got back there. At the very end, he's holding a holocron and he looks up and I think his eyes went red, no? Yeah, yeah. A little yeah but then I was asking, is it just a... Uh, Great animator who was like, oh, he has something red in his hand, so let's reflect red off his eyes. Or are we saying something with that? And I can't get a straight answer. I'm shocked. <laughs> you know, what's, what's great is you should have seen, he had to stand between Freddie and Sam to record his lines. 
And Freddie knows a lot about Star Wars, and Sam knows everything about Star Wars. And I know a ton about Star Wars. Right, yeah, and you, you, it was like, it's like playing out before my very eyes, as Whitware is just coercing Taylor over to his side, because you know Whitware, and if he was here, that'd be crazy, but I thought Sam's performance was great. He is really something else as well, and you guys played off each other really, really well, so it's just interesting to see you guys all just being who you are, you couldn't be anything else that's interesting, fascinating. <laughs> no, I would say, Taylor, your performance really convinced me. I'm like, oh, maybe, you know what? Maybe Maul's okay. I should know better. Maybe. And I want to talk a little about Maul, and any of you can speak to this. I feel, you know, he's bitter towards the Sith in a way that I don't think necessarily Ahsoka's bitter towards the Jedi, but they both walked away from their previous lives. What sort of parallels do you see between them? <laughs> well, he, he's red and she's orange, and that's very parallel. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was an interesting thing. It was almost like a, a side thing that you kind of realized along the way that during Clone Wars, we had created, we had gotten away from just being absolute about you're either a Jedi or you're a Sith. And there were people that were disenfranchised, adventurous among them that kind of lost their path and lost their way. And those two characters, Ahsoka and Maul, had come together in a more final story that we didn't get to finish on Clone Wars. So you can see hints of that in their dialogue where the two of them talk as if they've met before, because indeed they had. And it was a very important moment in the, in the timeline of Clone Wars that those two characters crossed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all about the way Maul would digest what happened to him and throw it into the realm of, I need to seek revenge. And Ahsoka would take it and not make it about that like she doesn't want to believe i'll give you something here she doesn't want to believe that anakin would be capable of becoming darth vader and when we were talking about the possibility uh, george and i talked at length about order 66 and ahsoka and what happened and we had it all figured out and one of the biggest things one of the key elements is that her whole life once she's trained by anakin when she's at peace and calm and looks into the force she can sense the presence of her friend. And this is something that, that occurs. When, when tragedy strikes someone, you'll read an article about someone that tells something bad happened to their parent or their sibling, and they call and something's happened. So you, you have this connection between people. She's always looked at the force and, and been able to be comforted that he is there. When Order 66 happens, uh, she reaches out to the force and he's gone. There is no Anakin Skywalker. So just like there are non-existence of so many Jedi, she assumes he's dead. So when she encounters Darth Vader at the beginning of Rebels season two, she looks into this dark void and at the center of it, she gets hit by something that's so familiar, it's overpowering, that it just shocks her back and she goes unconscious. Her unconscious mind is completely aware that Darth Vader is Anakin Skywalker, but her conscious mind can't handle it. She just cannot accept that truth. So she spends the whole season basically coming to grips with that fact, which we see in the Jedi Temple, that this is the truth. Once she understands the truth that Darth Vader is Anakin Skywalker, she is faced with the same problem Luke Skywalker faces, which is Luke says, I cannot kill my own father, and she cannot kill this person that was her dear friend. She cannot do it. But nor will she leave him and abandon him. She feels like she did before because she feels guilt. Because if he became this terrible dark person that's done all these horrible things, she feels like she is in part responsible because she could have been there and prevented it. That's not necessarily true, but tell her that. So that's, those are the type of things she's dealing with. And I've drawn a lot of parallels to the writers between what Lancelot feels guilt-wise for the betrayal of Arthur and the kingdom there you know, anything with Parsifal or Galahad, like these type of knights that do great deeds, but they become scarred. And this is Ahsoka's problem. Also, I've spoken at length about Gandalf. So if you want to really understand Ahsoka in this time period and what's happening to her, you, you could read Lord of the Rings, but you, you've probably seen that, but you should read it. And, but re get the book on letters that Tolkien wrote where he explains in detail more of the things that are really going on under the surface of his characters. And I used a lot of that um, extensively to inform what's happening uh, to her. 
So that's some good stuff there. And people <laughs> might have to go read, which is always a good thing to do. So Ahsoka, the white's gonna show up at the Battle of Rohan, is what you're... You're, you're thinking more along the lines of the truth now. <laughs> but you must understand what that would fully mean for her, which would be interesting, but we don't know. I mean, I don't know, but it really depends how many seasons we get. What you really wanna to talk to is, is Gary and Eric and Troy and say, you know, I sound like a pledge drive on public channel now, but keep making this show. Gosh darn, that was some dark stuff, but I'm still there with you. But let's have some fun episodes, and we will. Lots of fun, more Chopper. Yeah. I see it, Troy. <laughs> uh, Ashley, you've brought Ahsoka so far and you knew she was going to confront Darth Vader. What, what was it like, I guess, to record, even recording, going back a couple episodes, recording with Matt again as Anakin? Can you talk a little about <laughs> the emotions involved? Yeah, well, now is probably when I get a little too emotional and Dave says, ah, Ahsoka's not that emotional. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, recording with Matt, honestly, I thought those days were done. I mean, I really didn't think I'd ever get to record with Matt again. Um, and so to get that opportunity to record with him was truly a gift. Um, and, and I didn't believe up until that point, I didn't believe that Ahsoka knew that that was Darth Vader. I still thought that, you know, she was skeptical. All the fans were like, oh, she knows, she knows. And I was like, I don't really think she knows. Kind of like what Dave said. You know, it's like believing that a family member could murder someone. You just can't believe that. So, um... After that recording with Matt is, you know, when she finds out and it was it was now having to face the reality that, OK, that those happy times are are gone. Those, those are no more. And now I need to confront the fact that Anakin is Darth Vader. And, you know, I've always said that I no matter what happens with Ahsoka, I trust Dave. So whether she lives or dies, he's always going to do the right thing for the overall Star Wars story. And so whatever that be, I'm, I you know, promise this and I'm always fine with it. Um, and of course, I became so attached to her and I didn't want anything bad to happen to her. But he once told me that if Ahsoka and Vader faced off, it wouldn't be a good thing for Ahsoka. <laughs> So, and that was several years ago. And so I always had that in the back of my head. It's like, okay, I trust Dave. I want her to live. I want her to live. But, oh, it's not going to be good for Ahsoka. <laughs> so um, I was just so nervous. And then I would get photos on my phone of Ahsoka with her head chopped off that <laughs> Dave and Henry would send me from record sessions. Like, ha ha, oh, that was have Henry. a good that was day. Henry. Yeah, I didn't say that. Remember, I told you that was too much. I said that was you too know. much. So the writers, once they get involved with images, they just lose all sense of reality. They say, I can't picture, and they go like crazy. They should have just done it in words, right? It should have only been words, yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> oh, man, that was weird. Ooh, weird, weird, ooh. You know, I think Matt Lanner is the only one that knew what happened. Because I, I thought in, the, in my mindset, but anyway, I found it really compelling that I could tell him what happened and you, you not know because you guys work together so long and we never see him because he's off, you know, and he, he's barely on the show because he's like eight lines all together. So I thought it'd be really kind of funny to tell Matt what happened because I would call Matt and be like, hey, I need you to record one more line because I would work on this. I'd be like, I need one more line. And he's like, what do you need? I need you to say, and you will die. And I'm like, he's like, oh, that's good. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be funny. So let's record that line. Because we know you, and we know you're personal. You'll take it. But it was kind of a bonding thing. We, and we turned it into a bonding thing for us. It became very good and a strengthening, you know. But yeah, he's Vader now, so he's the guy cuckoo. But it, it was a good thing for us. I don't know if he knew. I don't think he knows whether you survive or not. He hasn't seen it, but he was aware of a little bit more. Because Vader, you know, Vader does a lot, so it makes more sense. see where I am on the pecking order. No, it's fine. You're fine. You're fine. You like a whole thing in the lightsaber. You fought Maul. You fought Vader. You fought... Look at all those people. You so, so I want to know, am I reprinting the Ahsoka Lives t-shirt? Or am I, I think, but I think what you do, dead t -shirt. I think what's great about this, what's great about, again, it's kind of like you could sell two shirts. This is what I do. I help her out all the time. But what you do is you sell this shirt for like the optimist, right? <laughs> and then you sell a new shirt with, and just all you have to do to take that design out a question mark. And that's all you have to do. 
It's a really inexpensive thing. You could even take like back stock you have of additional shirts that can't sell, and you could just like boom, put a question mark on it, and it's a whole new shirt. It's a brand new shirt. You can sell that one. Mark it up. Good.